Let's take a look at the joints of the upper extremity. We're going to start proximally at the shoulder complex and we'll finish distally at the interphalangeal joints of the fingers. As the name implies, the shoulder is a complex, which means that it has more than one joint. If we look at the shoulder in total, we will see that there are three joints and one articulation. Sternoclavicular joint, the acromioclavicular joint, the glenohumeral joint, and the scapulothoracic articulation. If we blow up our picture here and take a better look, we'll see the sternoclavicular joint is an articulation between the sternum and the sternal end of the clavicle. The acromioclavicular joint is an articulation between the distal end of the clavicle and the acromion process of the scapula. The glenohumeral joint connects together the head of the humerus and the glenoid fossa of the scapula. And finally, it's not a true joint, but you will soon see the importance of the scapula moving on the thoracic wall. But let's begin with the sternoclavicular joint. The sternoclavicular joint joins the sternum and the clavicle. It has two degrees of freedom. For the first degree of freedom, the axis of rotation is an anterior-posterior axis that goes through the sternal end of the clavicle. It will allow for the movements of elevation and depression in the frontal plane. So as you can see here, we have elevation in gold, and we have depression here in blue. Our second axis is a longitudinal axis that goes through the distal end of the sternum. It will allow for protraction and retraction to occur in the transverse plane. So as you can see, we have retraction here in gold, and we have protraction here in blue. Because the sternoclavicular joint has two degrees of freedom, it is going to be characterized as a saddle joint. Next, we have the acromioclavicular joint, which is the articulation between the clavicle and the acromion process of the scapula. There is one degree of freedom for the AC joint. The axis of rotation for that degree of freedom is an anterior-posterior axis that goes through the distal end of the clavicle. It will allow for upward and downward rotation of the scapula. This movement occurs in the plane of the scapula. So you see here in gold, we have downward rotation of the scapula, which will point the glenoid fossa inferiorly. And in blue, we have the upward rotation of the scapula, which will cause the glenoid fossa to be pointing superiorly. Now, even though this joint has one degree of freedom. It is characterized as being a planar or gliding joint. I should also mention that there are other small accessory motions that occur at the AC joint, which you will probably learn about in more advanced classes. Now we can take a look at the scapula thoracic articulation. The scapula thoracic articulation has no independent motion, but the motions at the scapula thoracic articulation are a combination of SC and AC joint motions. So we can see here that the scapula can move forward on the thorax. That would be protraction. It can move rearward on the thorax. That would be retraction. It can move upward on the thorax. That would be elevation. It can move downward on the thorax. That would be depression. As mentioned previously, we can ha also have downward rotation on the thorax, which would point the glenoid fossa inferiorly, or upward rotation of the scapula on the thorax, which would cause the glenoid fossa to be pointing superiorly. I have a short video here which demonstrates scapula thoracic motion. What I want to emphasize here is how much that scapula is actually moving as the humerus rotates. It should be appreciated that proper shoulder health is going to require a coordination between scapula thoracic motions and glenohumeral motions. Next, we have the glenohumeral joint. The glenohumeral joint connects the humerus and the scapula. It has three degrees of freedom. For the first degree of freedom, there is a medial lateral axis through the humeral head. Rotations about this axis incurs flexion and extension in the sagittal plane. So you can see here we have extension in gold 
and we have flexion here in blue. For the next plane of movement, we have an anterior-posterior axis through the humeral head. Movements that occur about this axis will be abduction and adduction in the frontal plane. So you can see here we have adduction in gold, and then we have abduction in blue. For our final axis of rotation, we have a longitudinal axis that goes through the humeral head. Motions that occur about this axis will be internal and external rotation in the transverse plane. So you can see we have external rotation here in gold, and we have internal rotation here in blue. Having three degrees of freedom, the glenohumeral joint is a ball and socket joint. So in order to summarize total shoulder motion, first we need to talk about scapulothoracic motion. Sternoclavicular motion plus acromioclavicular motion equals scapulothoracic motion. Scapulothoracic motion plus glenohumeral motion equals the total shoulder motion. And as illustrated here, to reinforce what you saw earlier in the video, we can see that proper shoulder health requires a coordination between scapulothoracic and glenohumeral motions. Arm elevation is raising the hand overhead. There are three different types of arm elevation that we can talk about. Flexion, scaption, and abduction. In class, I'm going to ask you to discuss which motions are occurring at the shoulder joints with each. And by shoulder joints, I mean all of them, including the acromioclavicular, the sternoclavicular, the scapulothoracic articulation, and the glenohumeral joints. Now let's turn our attention to the elbow complex. You can see the elbow complex here, but let's blow it up and take a better look. The elbow complex is actually comprised of two joints. We have an articulation between the radius and the humerus, the humeroradial joint, and between the ulna and the humerus, or the humero-ulnar joints. The elbow has one degree of freedom. The axis is a medial lateral axis that goes through the humeral epicondyles. Motions about this axis includes flexion and extension in the sagittal plane. So once again, we can see extension here in gold, and we can see flexion here in blue. The elbow joint has a single degree of freedom and is characterized as a hinge joint. Next, we can look at the radio ulnar joints. The radio ulnar joints have a single degree of freedom. There is an oblique axis that runs through the humeral head that will allow for pronation and supination in the transverse plane. We have one degree of freedom for the radio ulnar joints. The proximal and distal radio ulnar joints are classified as a pivot joint, while the middle radio ulnar joint is classified as a syndesmotic joint. Here is another look at the elbow axis of rotation from a different vantage point. From here, we can see the motions that will occur will be pronation and supination in the transverse plane. Our gold arrow here indicates supination, and our blue arrow here represents pronation. Now let's take a look at the wrist joint. The wrist joint connects together the radius and the proximal carpal row and the ulna and the proximal carpal row. The wrist has two degrees of freedom. The axis of rotation for the first degree of freedom is a medial lateral axis that goes through the capitate. Motions about this axis are flexion and extension in the sagittal plane. And once again, we can see extension here in gold, and we can see flexion here in blue. For the second degree of freedom, we have an anterior-posterior axis that goes through the capitate. Motions that occur about this axis incur radial deviation and ulnar deviation in the frontal plane. In gold here, we can see ulnar deviation, which is when the fifth digit comes closer to the ulna. And in blue, we can see radial deviation when the thumb comes closer to the radius. The wrist, having two degrees of freedom, is a condyloid joint. Now let's look at the carpometacarpal and intercarpal joints excluding the first CMC. Bones connected by these joints are the metacarpal bones to the distal carpal row and the carpal bones to each other. 
there are zero rotational degrees of freedom, which means there is no applicable axis of rotation or joint rotations, nor planes of movement. These joints are classified as being gliding joints. Now we can look at the first carpometacarpal or CMC joint, which is at the thumb. Before continuing, we should acknowledge that when referencing movements of the thumb, it is important to remember that those movements are referenced when the radio ulnar joints are in a neutral position, halfway between pronation and supination. This is one exception to joint motions being referenced to the anatomical position. The first CMC joint has two degrees of freedom. The axis of rotation for the first degree of freedom is a medial lateral axis that goes through the trapezium. This will allow for flexion and extension in the sagittal plane. So we can see here in blue, we are going to have flexion, and in yellow here, we have extension. For our second degree of freedom, we have an anterior posterior axis that goes through the face of the first metacarpal. This will allow for ab and adduction to occur in the frontal plane. And again, remember here, movements are going to be referenced to the plane of the hand. So blue would represent abduction, and gold here would represent adduction. The first CMC joint has two degrees of freedom and is characterized as a saddle joint. Next, we have the metacarpal phalangeal joints, or the MCP joints. The metacarpal phalangeal joints have two degrees of freedom. The axis of rotation for the first degree of freedom is a medial lateral axis that goes through the head of the metacarpals. It will allow for flexion and extension in the sagittal plane. So once again, we can see that we have gold being extension and blue being flexion. It is important to note that finger movements in the frontal plane are referenced to the midline of the hand and not the midline of the body. Our second degree of freedom has an axis of rotation that is an anterior posterior axis through the metacarpal head. This will allow for abduction and adduction in the frontal plane. So you can see here that we have a deduction in gold moving towards the midline of the hand and a deduction in blue moving away from the midline of the hand. However, if we were looking at a different digit that was on the other side of the midline of the hand, these directions would end up being reversed. The metacarpal phalangeal joints have two degrees of freedom and are characterized as condyloid joints. Finally, we have the inner phalangeal joints. The inner phalangeal joints connect the proximal and the middle or the middle and the distal phalanges. There is a single degree of freedom. The axis of rotation for this degree of freedom is a medial lateral axis that goes through the head of the proximal phalange. It will allow for flexion and extension to occur in the sagittal plane. And once again, we see gold is our extension and blue is our flexion. The single degree of freedom means the interphalangeal joints are hinge joints. All right, let's try and take a look at some of the joint motions here a little bit more dynamically. My model cannot demonstrate the proximal segment moving on the distal segment, so that's something that we'll cover in our class discussions. But what I can do is demonstrate for you the distal segment moving on the more proximal segment. My model also cannot demonstrate any scapular motions, so I will not be demonstrating anything doing with the SC joint, the AC joint, or the scapula thoracic articulation. Again, that's something we'll have to cover in class. But with that said, let's go ahead and let's try and look at some joint motions that are occurring at the glenohumeral joint. To begin, we can look at flexion and extension. So we have flexion, extension, flexion, and extension. Okay, I'm going to flip over here. In this position here, we can look at abduction and adduction. Abduction and adduction. Abduction and adduction. And let's see if we can flip over here to where we can now see internal rotation of the shoulder, external rotation. Internal, external. In fact, let's blow that up a little bit. Try and make that a little bit more clear where we can see external and internal rotation. To get another view of that, let's flip up. Let's come out a little bit. Let's go ahead and flex the arm. 
Now here, once again, you can see shoulder internal rotation, shoulder external rotation, shoulder internal rotation, shoulder external rotation. Now, a final movement that we have here at the shoulder is going to be horizontal flexion and extension, or horizontal ab and adduction. So first we'll demonstrate it here in the more standing position. Or if we come out here, this would be horizontal abduction or horizontal extension. And this would be horizontal adduction or horizontal flexion. Again, let's flip over here and maybe look at it from a different angle. And again, from this position here, this would be horizontal adduction or horizontal flexion, horizontal abduction or horizontal extension. Now we'll zoom in and we'll take a look at the rest of the upper extremity. All right, let's take a look at some motions here occurring at the elbow. So you can see here we're going to have flexion and extension, flexion, extension, flexion, extension. I'm going to roll over to here. And let's flex the elbow. And now we can take a look at pronation and supination, pronation supination, pronation and supination. Let's kick back over this view right here. And let's take a look at what's happening at the wrist. So here you see flexion and extension, flexion and extension, flexion, extension. Okay, let's come back to this view right here. Radial deviation and ulnar deviation. Remember with radial deviation, the thumb is coming closer to the radius. And with ulnar deviation, the fifth digit is coming closer to the ulna. Okay, we can come back. Uh, let's look at that first CMC joint. In fact, let's rotate here. I'm sorry, let's pronate up here. I'm kind of go a little bit at the side right here. Now we can see that's going to be thumb extension and thumb flexion, thumb extension and flexion. And again, that's occurring in the plane of the palm. Okay, now let's come over here. And let's drop down to this position here. And now we can see that we're going to have abduction and adduction. Abduction is away from the plane of the hand. Adduction is towards the plane of the hand. Okay, and now let's come over here. Let's come more of a sagittal view, drop down a little bit, come up, blow it up. And now for that MCP joint, we can see here where we're going to have flexion and extension, the MCP joint, flexion, extension. Uh, let's rotate down. We're now you'll be able to see abduction and adduction, abduction and adduction. Come back up. And we can take a look at that proximal interphalangeal joint, flexion and extension. And then that distal interphalangeal joint, flexion and extension. Again, we demonstrated distal moving on proximal. My model could not demonstrate proximal moving on distal. That's something we'll do in the group sessions.